I'm Julie Bartke with this Senate Update. Trying to address a potential teacher shortage in the state of Minnesota was the impetus behind legislation introduced in the Senate E-12 Finance and Policy Committee on Thursday morning. Some of the testimony around that legislation was emotional. Here are some portions from that committee. Um, over the last two, three years, there's been kind of a growing number of people and meetings that I've gone to, school districts that I uh, visited, uh, young uh, people who have come out of colleges, teachers colleges, and, and uh, shared some of the concerns about the um, uh, teacher licensure test that was put in place and the uh, problems of, of um, taking that test and passing that test and so that they could get their teacher teaching license, licensure. So I, um, this last year, I was at a, uh, one of the school regional meetings and superintendents, there was uh, quite a number of superintendents there and they were all talking about how difficult it was to hire teachers. And they had openings uh, that were um, uh, there <coughs> for, for a long period of time. And I said, well, I, I really have to, tackle this and try to do something. Actually, I wasn't the only one that, that has, that got interested in it because I think there's a number of bills uh, from uh, uh, outright repeal to modifying it one way or another. So I think many of us are looking at this issue as something that we really need to try to solve this session so that we can uh, allow um, um, an adequate number of teachers to be hired and, and facilitate uh, young people who are coming out of the teaching or want to get into the teaching profession. Uh, the bill before you, Senate File 298, provides one approach to providing locally elected school boards more flexibility in hiring and retaining high quality teachers in every classroom in the state of Minnesota. We would also like to encourage you to take a closer look at a couple of other bills. Uh, MSBA is working on with some other members, and one of them would, uh, in order to help provide additional flexibility, one would treat an out-of-state licensed teacher the same as a probationary teacher. We think that has a lot of promise as well. Uh, another one would provide student loan forgiveness as an incentive for, for uh, stu for teachers to go teach in different parts of the state. For, um, so we would like you to also keep those bills in mind. They're not before us today, but they are uh, going to be coming forward. So uh, as part of my testimony, I just must admit that this is not an issue that I would have anticipated to be on our 2015 legislative platform. But as many times the chair of the committee has referenced, MSBA has a grassroots, member-driven um, approach to developing our legislative platform. In 2014, at our MSBA <clears throat> delegate assembly, we overwhelmingly passed two resolutions that urged the legislature to provide school boards more flexibility in the hiring and retaining of high, high quality teachers. When I had an elementary position open at that time, I had anywhere from 100 to 150 applicants for one position. Thief River Falls is a school district that's more than twice as large as that school district is. This past year we had four incredible openings in our school district and we had 11 applicants for those elementary positions. Um, we were fortunate because we were able to get many of, you know, very high quality practitioners in these positions, but several of the applicants weren't able to pass the MTLEs, at least on their first try, and many of them were having difficulties to, to make sure that they were, they had all the criteria met so that they could teach. Um, elementary is one of those that, um, you know, I always felt that there were lots of applicants for those positions, and now, um, that was really an alarming thing to me as a superintendent. We also, when our enrollment increased as school started, we looked at hiring two more elementary positions. 
We were not able to find teacher candidates for those positions until December when some of our graduates were um, graduated from college in the middle of the year. And so we finally filled those positions as of the second semester uh, because we had the candidates available. I have a learning disability in uh, the language of reading and comprehension. Um, I've yet to pass, or excuse me, I have passed the test uh, of math reading um, of the Praxis series. Um, some of you guys might appreciate that. Towards the back, I have some documentations of when it used to be the Praxis series, right? Um, but now as the MTLE uh, has come across, um, I have yet to pass the basic skills writing test. I've taken it numerous times. Um, honestly, I've forgotten how many times um, I've taken it. I've passed my uh, Praxis art content and my pedagogy test. Um, clearly describing, again, in the documentations and pictures um, that I'm fully competent in uh, what I do as, a, as an art educator. I was two points away um, from the Praxis 1 writing test. Um, I'm falling short, and falling short of the MTLE, you can see that towards the back as well before the teacher evaluation from my principal, that I have um, many points to uh, gain ground there. Um, I'm not even getting close to the bar there. Um, I must pass this test before July 1st, uh, or I'm out of uh, a teaching career, um, that I've been in a career for seven years, again, to repeat. Uh, talking to my superintendent specifically, he's uh, posted my job in April or May, um, as I find, as I move forward here. Um, so, a little urgency, but uh, not, not too anxious, right? Um, <laughs> if someone could please tell me how a time test uh, with no spell check, no grammar, writing test proves that I can teach art um, and reach students and impact them on a high level, uh, I will surrender my battle. Um, but until that uh, case, I will continue to fight my, for my career. During my time at Crown, I, was a, uh, I took the advice of my education professors and the chair of the education department uh, to delay taking the practice because Minnesota was developing a different test. They believe Minnesota has something better for me, even though they knew I struggle with test anxiety and test themselves. Once the MTLE was introduced, I began studying and taking the test. I have used tutors, study guides, books, and practice tests to help me through each test. At one point, I was studying alongside my professor, and we both failed the test. This has been a long journey, and I'm embarrassed to admit that I failed these tests 18 times. 18 times I've walked away as a failure, but I'm not a failure. I choose to hold my head high. I'm a good teacher. My colleagues think I'm a good teacher. My principal thinks I'm a good teacher, and I am a good teacher. My parents in my classroom are positive about their child's experience, but a time standardized multiple choice test calls me a failure, and I'm not a failure. I know I'm not alone in this. There are many teachers in the same position as I am. Some have already quit and some are being forced out. There's also a provision on the, on the payment of these tests. If you fail the same test five times, you have to wait for a waiver fee. Of course, that's assuming you want to wait for the waiver fee. I did that once, but most of the time I just continued to purchase the tests because I know I need to get them done. And just to give some context, we hired close to 500 teachers last year alone. Um, so we really see firsthand the challenges of making sure we have really high quality teachers uh, to meet the needs of our students in every classroom every day. Um, two things that really stand up for us, um, one is diversity. Our teacher diversity does not mirror our student diversity uh, at all, um, and it's continued to be an increasing problem for us. Um, we also continue to experience challenges when it comes to ensuring we have a broad talent pool to draw from when making staffing decisions. I know we've talked about, um, other people have testified about special ed and STEM. We also see this very deeply in with bilingual uh, bilingual teachers and really moving our immersion <coughs> programs forward and that's specifically where the MTLE becomes a big issue for us. Um, data show that the single most important indicator of teacher effectiveness is prior performance in the classroom. Um, I think with our robust teacher evaluation system we're able to see how a teacher <coughs> performs um, and make those assessments. We've got a strong selection model, um, the time for tenure and teacher eval um, that really <coughs> helps us do that. We've actually been working with our higher ed partners very closely um, to make sure they're, they're, we're partnering to to build that pipeline. We've also invested ourselves as a district to build a Grow Your Own program um, to really build a pipeline of bilingual teachers for our students and had to make that investment on our own. Um, and some very specific examples, we've actually had to release high quality teachers 
bilingual teachers in our immersion programs because they were not able to pass the MTLEs. Um, we've actually tried to keep them in our schools in different positions, um, but that has been a real issue for us. Um, so again, I think our efforts have tried to, to improve uh, the quality of teaching, but this is a barrier for us, um, as well as other license issues we face. For too many, the current test is not working, and I share, shed tears along with many of you listening to a couple of the compelling stories that we heard. Um, last year, I shared extensively with the committee all kinds of issues about testing, and so I'm not going to go in problems with this test. I'm not going to share that now. Um, I would just add or mention that in response to last year's statutory change allowing the ACT or SAT to be substituted for the Metal Basic Skills Test, uh, the Board of Teaching did uh, commission a correlation study by ACT, um, which indicated that a composite score between 24, or scores between 24 and 26 um, would be comparable to the Metal Basic Skills Test. Um, as many of you may know, that's higher than what most of our institutions require, colleges and universities in the state, public and private, require for admission. That's higher than any of our neighboring states require for licensure. And currently, um, all but one of our teacher prep programs have an ACT average um, that's within that range. Only one is below it at an uh, average composite of 23, which again raises the issue if our candidates are scoring that high in the ACT and having trouble with the metal basic skills test, but none of the other tests isn't the problem, really the test itself. It's not measuring what we want it to measure. Um, um, however, we do have a concern about uh, the specifics of this bill, and that is that it would place the licensure decision in the hands of individuals. Regardless of their skills and their strengths, their commitment, um, we don't believe that it would allow for fair and equitable licensure um, practices. And frankly, I don't think it will preclude the problems you heard today. If I'm hired um, on a limited license, um, I will know, and I haven't passed the test, I'll know that after two years there's a possibility that my supervisor will submit a letter saying that I've met the requirements, but I'm not going to know that that's going to happen. And so I think if it were me, I would feel the need to continue taking the test <coughs> to see if I couldn't pass it. So I'm not sure it will fix the problem quite in the way we would hope. I believe you know that uh, you commissioned basically a task force um, a year or so ago, um, maybe it's been two years now, uh, to look at the, these test, many of these testing issues. They brought back a solid recommendation that the test should be eliminated as unnecessary because of an array of assessments that candidates already have to pass um, in order to become licensed. And again, the Board of Teaching has recently reached the same conclusion. Um, there's a lot of talk today about teacher shortages, and I think uh, I said some things about that in your first committee hearing, and I'm not going to add more to it now other than to say that I think um, you've heard many comments today that there are a lot of factors to be considered there. <coughs> Um, but perhaps the key challenge is to think about how to make teaching more attractive so that more individuals are interested in going into it and also to provide the support needed for those individuals to achieve licensure. So my, my, my key point really is if the current policy isn't working, and it seems to me that all of the testimony today indicates that, then I believe and MACTI believes it's the policy that should be changed rather than offering fixes for individual candidates in individual circumstances. Your job is to determine what the appropriate policy is. And I don't think that you've heard today any compelling testimony to indicate that the policy is working. So my recommendation would be to take the spirit and the commitment and the passion of Senator Stumpf and the other testifiers and look at the statute, and instead of providing just a fix that could be made by individual supervisors for individual teachers, please fix this policy for all teacher candidates in Minnesota. Senator, I am appreciative of the intent that, that you have with this bill, and I, I understand why you want to move it forward. I am not sure that I can support it. And the reason is not that I don't believe that what you're trying to do is, uh, is, uh, is something that we have to do. It's just that I agree with uh, Ms. Christ 
that the problem is the test, and this legislation does not address that. The way, the way this is structured is, is that if you take the test and, and don't pass, uh, you can get a two, uh, um, actually it's, I believe, Senate Council laid it out as a, uh, a one-year temporary license for up to two years. So you two one-year temporary licenses. And then, and then if they still can't pass the test, then upon um, uh, having taken all the courses, the college courses in the curriculum areas, and having the pedagogy and all of the uh, teaching uh, uh, curriculum satisfied, I mean, they've taken that, and if they get a uh, report or a written statement from the uh, school district, which I would assume would be from the uh, either the principal or the superintendent, a positive uh, statement uh, after an evaluation for period of two years, then they can get their license, permanent license. From hearing the testimony, I can see that there is a problem. I'm just not convinced that this is the solution. And I don't know that removing the test is either, because I think most Minnesotans would say, for when it comes to basic skills, we would want all of our teachers to at least have basic skills. And so I look at this definition of basic skills, and I quick took a look with the help of staff at taking a quick look at some reading samples, writing samples, and math samples. And I have to say, I'd be challenged to do those math samples. If that's basic skills, wow. We, our kids are really doing phenomenal things, because basic skills, um, to me, uh, it was interesting in reading that. The writing sample and the reading sample items that I saw were quite reasonable. And again, it's just a sample, just a few questions, but I think there's kind of an expectation. But I don't know that that means the equivalent of an ACT 24 to 26 is basic skills, all right? So I don't know for sure if I understand right, it is the Board of Teaching that creates this basic skills teacher test. And I just wanna first of all check is that is correct. And then if this is what you have decided as a Board of Teaching is the basic skills, I would expect that you would know a lot of what teachers come from, what they need to do, and that you are the ones that have set that standard. So I would have high regard for that. And if you have set that standard, why are you now saying basically that, that maybe that's not acceptable or not right? I just, they're conflicting kinds of things going on here. Several years ago, the Board of Teaching um, decided to define basic skills for these purposes much higher than what I think most of us would think of as basic skills. They decided to set them at about a mid-college level. Um, I don't think most of us would think of, of that level as basic skills. And that, I think the, the uh, in a sense, you'll, one would say the accuracy of setting the basic skills test at that level is borne out by the correlation study but by ACT that equated that to you know, scores in the range of 24 to 26. So I think you're absolutely on the right track with your, your question about basic skills. Um, the one other thing that I will say before Erin has a chance to speak is, um, and, I, and I said this many times last year and the year before in talking <coughs> about bills introduced by Senator Dahl and, and others, um, that our candidates First, I want to say that MACD absolutely um, believes in assessment. Clearly, it's essential that we evaluate the skills, the knowledge, the dispositions of our candidates. We absolutely believe that we should be held accountable for our programs and how the students in our programs do. Because of that, our candidates are required to complete and pass many, many assessments from requirements to be admitted to a college or university, which often is, I'm sure you know, include things like ACT and SAT scores. In uh, the state universities, they have to achieve a certain score in the AccuPlacer Accu test to indicate that they don't need remedial education or to take remedial courses if, if their test scores indicate that that's required. 
Then there are standards for admission um, to the programs. In many cases, I'm talking about the program of, of education, of teacher preparation. In many cases, those include a writing assessment. Um, they'll include a math assessment or specified grades on math courses and so on. So there's that, that set of assessments. Of course, they have to pass all of the required courses, uh, demonstrating that they've met all of those assessments. In addition to the basic skills test, they have to pass a test of pedagogy, which most of you, I think, are educators, but basically that's how you teach. Um, they have to pass a content area test in the area in which they want to teach. Their candidates are not having trouble with that. They're passing the pedagogy test at high rates. They're passing their content tests at high rates. They have to pass student teaching which obviously is a performance assessment. And passing that includes um, all of the comments and evaluation of their supervisors. Then they have to complete the EdTPA, um, which is Education and Teacher Performance Assessment, which is a very comprehensive assessment-based, uh, performance-based assessment. So they have to, you know, they have to demonstrate in so many ways that they have the skills and the knowledge and the dispositions necessary to be good teachers. The one problem that's happening, that's occurring for more and more candidates, is this single test, the metal basic skills test. And we believe that the problems are that it was set at too high a level to be realistic. So, you know, does an art t high school art teacher need a mid-level college set of math skills, as an example? Um, and we also believe that despite all of the best efforts, and we know they were extensive, and we know they involved some Minnesota teachers, that there are some problems in this test, uh, issues of bias um, for people of other racial, cultural, language backgrounds, which should not be obvious to many of us who come from what's been the majority culture in this country. But I think we have to believe when we look at the performance of all candidates on those tests and listen to other experts talk about them, that even if a reading question about baseball seems obvious to us, it's not going to be obvious to somebody who comes from a culture in which they haven't watched baseball being played. So they don't know those terms of baseball. Uh, this is an example of uh, the fact that licensure in general and ba a basic skills test as an outgrowth of the licensure process is completely detached from any uh, value for the consumer or any uh, 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 measure of effectiveness in general. I think it's interesting uh, that we're having this discussion actually here because on so many occupational licensing issues I have that same argument. Um, and in fact, even the Obama administration has identified that in his upcoming proposal for the next year as a real problem and a real impediment in all areas of occupational licensing. He's teamed up with the uh, far right wing nut jobs of the Brookings Institute um, to, uh, to talk about how this is negatively impacting um, particularly people of lower and, and middle income uh, levels and, and access into the, into the economy. Um, uh, I, I think, um, like I said, I think you're going to have challenges probably uh, as much from your own caucus as ours because what you're laying out here is essentially where I think we would want to end up, which is moving away from sort of these um, uh, sanitary, um, unrelated measurements of effectiveness or, or certification and towards a system that is more student-centric. And, and that being measured, by, um, being measured by the folks that are in a best position to make that determination, which are the kids, the, the, the adults that are working with the kids in the schools that they're in. So We've made several different attempts over the years. Senator Dahl had a proposal to eliminate the MTLEs, uh, the test. Uh, but what makes this relevant this year is that 2015 is the first year for the all the districts have to go through the evaluation process and on into the future and it's going to get better and better the evaluation that that uh, you heard that uh, uh, Ms. Larson uh, mentioned is a quite an extensive process that they're going through and and the same way with uh, Superintendent Brown so I think uh, um, you're right what we're trying to do here is to kind of get put it back to those uh, assessments back to those people who are the close 
have the closest contact to those teachers. And, and I think that makes it much more relevant and important because they're the ones that are assessing them. And if they're doing an excellent job, <coughs> whether you have a, you know, uh, as demonstrated by the testimony here, a difficulty taking a test, and I'd probably be one of those, um, that's not what's important. What's important is that they're changing the lives of, of students and doing a very effective job of education. So I, I think that's kind of the nuts and bolts of the, of the bill.